everyone. I'm Rita Kakati Shah. I'm your host for the UMA Show. Welcome to your one stop journey for feeling empowered. We're a platform for change. We build confidence. We are your voice. We want you to be bold, be you, be UMA. Today, we are exploring diversity and inclusion in the newsroom. And I'm so excited to be joined by today's goddess of go-getting, Nina Goswami, who is not only the creative diversity lead at the BBC, but she's also a fellow Assamese from London. Welcome, Nina. Hi. <laughs> so I'm going to start off by saying, Gi Kobar which is an Assamese greeting, as you know, and it's yeah. so nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's wonderful to see you as well. Keep up to you as well. Um. <laughs> so I love the fact that you're from London. You have Assamese heritage. You've always had a knack for writing as well. So just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, obviously, you know a lot about me already, Rita. Um, I probably know a few things about you that I won't be telling your audience members. Um, but um, yeah, as you say, born and brought up in London. Um, my parents uh, came over in the 60s uh, from Assam. And um, as you know, well, we both grew up together um, in London. And we were really fortunate, I think, that, you know, our parents... Um, as first generation in this country stayed together um, and so it meant that obviously we got to celebrate Assamese uh, culture um, so we have the Bihu um, every year um, kind of April time which was always really really fantastic and you know Wasn't that was so much fun. <laughs> absolutely it was a shame we couldn't hold it this year because of Covid but um, yeah. you know that's been going on now for the first 40 years isn't it which is absolutely yeah. amazing um, and um, I, I always remember um, one of our uh, uncles, as we call them, don't we? Uncle Sigda dressing up as Santa Claus uh, when we were kids at Christmas time. But it was yeah. a really great sense of community. And what I really loved was that, you know, we got to embrace our Assamese heritage, but we also yeah. embraced British heritage as well. Um, and our parents together as a collective were really... I think really keen on making sure that we had that dual heritage and I think that was absolutely yeah. fantastic. Wasn't it so powerful wasn't it just having that yeah. dual sort of upbringing yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely um, and I mean when you talk about my writing one of the things that really influenced you know where I am today of course are my parents so um, I've got quite a long story but I'm going to tell it anyway um, about kind of how I ended up in journalism and um, it really was um, down to my dad, uh, funnily enough. Um, so, you know, my brother's um, 11 years older than I am and this, so this is when I was about seven, eight years old. We're all sitting around the kitchen table. We're all talking about his future. Is he going to go to university? Obviously, he's Indian. Um, but, you know, what's he going to do with himself? That kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, there was like silence at the kitchen table and um, we had the telly on in the background and um, it was the BBC Six O'Clock News on at the time, which um, mm. is the um, UK's TV uh, national news bulletin, which goes on on. Right. Um, and uh, Maurice Stewart was uh, presenting and my, my dad turned around and said, I can see you doing that one day. And I was like, oh, mm. this, is, this is me at seven. <laughs> going oh that's interesting um and um well the idea of presenting uh, went away but the idea of journalism stayed with me and um that's really kind of the beginning of me kind of looking out researching thinking about what I could do uh, but it was actually my mum who was the one who started me off on on the track um yeah. and that was uh, from a little there that we have um, in our area, she um, bumped into the local council press officer who, um, I was about 15 at this time, um, who unbeknownst to, to, to her and also to me, my mum had managed to get me work experience for that summer at my local council press office. And then literally that was the beginning of my career. Um, from there, <laughs> local paper connections and, and so on. So yeah, really yeah. interesting. I love that. And because I remember like, you know, going back for actually from a Bihu perspective, you were our correspondence communication secretary. So you should write like, everything for us, all about copy, everything was basically Nina <laughs> writing it. So very familiar with all of that. But yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know actually how much of an influence actually your parents had in that. So thanks for sharing. Um, and obviously that started off your path 
in journalism, eventually in media, which you've actually spent your pretty much your entire professional career. Um, and you've even had stints at the Sunday Times and the Sunday Telegraph as well, haven't you? Um, I imagine that must have been pretty hectic. Um, could you share a little bit about your experiences there? Yeah, absolutely. No, I was, so, um, I was really fortunate. So um, it was through those connections I was saying that um, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship at the Sunday Times. Uh, so they were the ones who actually trained me up as a fully fledged journalist. Uh, so it was just off the back of my law degree. Um, and um, yeah, it was really interesting. So um, I think for me, I was a I was a cub reporter, as they as they call them. Um, so I was learning my trade with um, with the Sunday Times. So everything was a new experience. Um, but the the moment of real excitement was my first ever front page, um, and that was now sixteen years ago. So I, I suppose that gives you a, an idea of how old I am. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I don't look it. But, um, You're younger than I am, so it's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, 16 years ago, to get that first front page. And what was amazing about that, it was um, about um, the human cost of MMR, so the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. So at this time um, in our um, history, as it is history now, um, there was um, a scare around the use of the MMR jab, which was from, from these diseases. The result of people not taking that jab was that people who couldn't take that jab were being affected. Um, and I found, um, uncovered the two of the first people who um, were badly affected by the fact that there was no herd immunization from MMR um, and how these people have now been severely affected for the rest of their lives. And that was a really amazing moment because it changed what the government did and how they wow. were reacting to MMR. So. So that was the power of, of what we were doing. Um, and one of the things as well as being a young junior reporter is that they always send you off to do all the undercover work. Um, and so that was a real experience, you know, learning to be someone else for a couple of weeks. And um, so <laughs> I mean, it, genuinely, it really was. Um, so when I was at the Sunday Telegraph, um, one of the stories I always um, remember was when I um, was undercover as a missing script investigator. So I, <laughs> yeah, I know. So this was for the exam board um, OCR. So I went um, along and um, spent two weeks undercover there. Literally, the job was finding, getting, you get phone calls from people saying, oh, um, this script is missing. Um, or a phone call from the post office saying, oh, we've lost X, Y, and Z. Um, anyway, I was there for two weeks. They'd lost 10,000 scripts. Um, and this was for GCSE and A levels uh, students at the time, uh, and so that was a big story for us. And wow. Again, it something um, in the way that the system worked. So you know, it was that kind of journalism that really I, I was really proud of. Yeah, and that was quite amazing, actually. Kind of a bit James Bond-like, isn't it? Like, you kind of get into these sort of sleuthy situations. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And then sort of fast forward, really, from that love of journalism and your experiences, then you ended up joining the BBC, didn't you? Where you became a senior producer for BBC News. Um, and now, as a fan of the BBC News, from an audience perspective, we just get to watch what's shown on the TV. We react and we, we learn from it. However, there's an entire world of production that goes on behind the scenes, isn't there? Tell us a little bit about that and how it all comes together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I always like to think of um, these kind of analogies of, uh, have you heard the one about, you know, the swan? So, you know, the swan on, on the surface looks pristine and, and you know, <laughs> gliding along uh, the, the water, whereas underneath the legs are going um, and it's chaos. Uh, that's a little bit like what we are. <laughs> well, when there's breaking news, um, that's definitely what we're like. Um, but, you know, we have a structure and that's why we can react really quickly to things that are happening. We have the editor of the day who is in charge of, um, you know, the output um, and they're the ones who are assigning us, if, if that's the role I'm doing that day, sometimes I am the editor, um, the the story that we're going to be looking after and I was thinking about this um the other day because someone asked me this I think say for a half hour program that goes out on BBC One there's probably about 60 people on the day who are directly involved in that program 
But wow. around that, you've got the planning people beforehand and afterwards, and there are other things that need to be done. So you're looking to nearly 100 people who would have been involved in a TV production for a half hour programme. So you can kind of think about um, in a half hour programme, there's normally about eight stories um, that we'll be covering. Um, it might be that they're all COVID related, but there will be still um, eight different stories. Um, and so you'll have eight correspondents, you'd have eight producers. Um, so the producers would be the people behind the camera who are either working in the newsroom itself. So they're the kind of the liaison linchpin between the editor of the day and the, the team that are out on the ground. And then you have a producer out on the ground as well. Then you have the camera crew. And so all these different parts, but that's just to make one story. So you're doing that eight times. And you've got someone who's writing the scripts. You've got the presenter who's coming in. You've got someone cutting headlines. Uh, then you've got the people in the gallery. You've got the director, um, auto cue, camera, camera operators, floor uh, managers, makeup artists. You know, the list goes on. So you can see. Incredible. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so the logistics are really, um, they're, they're, they're quite complex. But, yeah. you know. You work together so much as a team, you kind of end up in this rhythm and to say as a result, when something does break, you know how to react because you you are together as a team and that's that's really great. Yeah, no, that sounds an incredible bond actually. I guess you get to really know everyone really, really well, especially after that much intensity during the day, every day, I think. Yeah. Um, and also like you're quite in charge of different pieces of content aren't you as well and I think you've always been a bit of a, a firm believer really that um, whether it's content on air or wherever it should always be representative of the true diversity of the society that we live in um, so tell us a bit more about your current role um, as BBC's creative diversity lead yeah no absolutely yeah no as you know I have um, a passion for making sure that audiences are Getting the educate, like you, you mentioned education, I think that's a really important thing. So, you know, audiences are, are seeing um, society as it is. Um, and so getting educated along the way as a result of that. And so my role as creative diversity lead is all about that. It's about looking at our content and seeing how can we make sure that it's reflective of society. Um, I also think about it in the sense of, you know, we can only be what we see. So, you know, when we were growing up, Moira Stewart was the only black female yeah. presenter um, for the news. So she was our only role model for anyone who wanted to go into journalism. Yeah. Uh, now we have Rita Chakrabarty, Michelle Hussein. Um, you know, we've got so many new faces and that's great to see that news has changed um, over time. But there is so much more to do um, in terms of representation. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do um, is the 50-50 project. So I'd be keen to tell you all about that if you're you're up for a... a bit oh, of a... I'm, totally, I'm actually going to ask you because leading, actually that's a really good segue because it's not just called the 50-50 project, but you've actually won multiple awards for the 50-50 project, which is, I think, I believe it's the biggest collective action on increasing women's representation in BBC content that there's ever been. Which is that? That's just incredible. And so, do tell us all about it. Really want to hear about it. So, yeah, it's my favourite story. So, which is why I would love to harp on about it for you. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> please do. <laughs> um, so it, it's basically the fifty fifty project, as you say, started as um, it, it started about women's representation, and it actually started with us as journalists and in the London newsroom. So um, I'll hop back to uh, Christmas 2016 and Roz Atkins, he is the presenter of um, the BBC World TV um, news programme called Outside Source. And mm -hmm. um, he was um, heading uh, to Cornwall, which is um, about three and a bit hours, is it? probably a bit more than that, outside of London. <laughs> uh, and um, he was listening to um, one of our radio stations, which I will not name. Um, <laughs> Um, and for an hour he didn't hear a single female voice on that radio station and in 2016 he was saying to himself how can that be how can that be the situation that you don't hear a woman's voice for an hour on one of the biggest radio stations in the UK mm. 
And so it got him thinking over the Christmas period. And when he came back to to um, London um, and started talking to his team, he'd come up with an idea. And it's such a simple idea. It's just to count the number of men and the number of women on the program that we control. And that's important. I'll explain why in a minute. To see if you can reach 50% women by um, the end of the month. And so the reason why the control element is important is that, you know, we as journalists don't have control over the fact that the Prime Minister of Britain at the moment is Boris Johnson. And we didn't have control over the fact that it was Theresa May before him. Um, So we don't count them um, in our count. We only count what we as journalists and content makers are able to count. So that would be like political commentators, you know, or economists or... You know, if we're doing um, a piece of investigative journalism, then everything would count because we control everything in that story. Right. Um, and so we're trying to reach it over a 50 percent, 50 percent over a month period uh, because we understand also that there's ebbs and flows in the news cycle. So um, as it stands at the moment, politics is very male dominated. So if we're um, doing a Brexit story, we know we're going to have more men on our program than we are women however if we're doing something about healthcare the likelihood is that it might be that there's more women on it so therefore you're looking at that ebb and flow so that's why we do it over a set period of time anyway that was one program they proved um that over a four month period that they could reach 50 percent women and then what happened is that that started to spread across the newsroom we all started hearing about it and decided just to do it ourselves um, so none of this was organised by the BBC. This was all from the journalists and the content makers themselves, wanting to make a change, understanding that, you know, we need to be representing society properly. Um, and then in the end, there was 80 teams um, who were involved. This is all word of mouth. And also Ros Atkins himself kind of going along and kind of doing some salesmanship. Um, but our then Director General, Tony Hall, heard about it. Um, and that's then amazing. Eight, eight, 80 teams you said that's eight zero eight zero teams and this was just wow. you know word of mouth it wasn't like organized by the corporation or anything like that um but then the the moment it accelerated was the moment that our director general the big boss um of the bbc right. um who was then tony hall heard about the project mm-hmm. and he went right i love this we're gonna <laughs> start the challenge we're gonna we're gonna see how many teams across the bbc can do it um, and one of the beauties of this project is that it is voluntary. Um, right. So we know that the people who are involved want to create the change. Mm. Um, anyway, let's fast forward now to 2020. There are now 600 teams across the BBC involved. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I, I just genuinely, I can't believe it. From, from you know, just uh, one one team doing some spread, like, you know, and the numbers on a spreadsheet to now 600 teams across the BBC, not only in news, but, you know, we have orchestras now using 50-50 in music and understanding, you know, we implement and change um, the methodology depending on uh, what we need um, to, to monitor, essentially. And we're just making that change across the board. Um, That's amazing. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. And you've been sort of um, now getting other organisations to kind of follow suit and partner as well, haven't you? How's that been? Yeah. So uh, yeah. No. It's, it. So again, I, you know, from this little small thing to, to where we are now, <laughs> I, thing, isn't it? <laughs> I have to pinch myself. I just think, you know, I'm a journalist. I don't really know much about all this stuff. But um, here we go. Um, Seventy-two organisations as of this week are now um, part of Fifty Fifty, um, and that's in twenty-two countries. Um, so uh, we have uh, public service broadcasters across the globe now involved, but we also have. Um, academic institutions using 50-50 in their actual coursework or when they're doing news days. We have um, corporate organisations like Unilever who are on board using it in their communications. So when they're looking at their spokespeople that they're putting up. Um, We have uh, PR companies um, also involved. Um, So again, looking at, you know, when they write a press release, are they being balanced in who, who they're quoting, um, the FT, Financial Times, 
ABC Australia. I could, uh, well, I'm not going to list all 72 for you. Um. But that, that, that's, that's amazing. Though. The fact is it's gone viral in a way for good reasons. And it's not just in the UK. It's not just in the States. It's all over the world, it sounds like. And it's crossing industries as well, which is amazing because you've always had traditional industries that you think, OK, well, they might be more susceptible to kind of partnering up. But then you go into different industries too. Like you've been going to music and sort of just different fields, which is actually so powerful out there. So. Yeah, one of the things that we um, we were thinking about when we started asking mm-hmm. other organisations outside media if they were interested in in having a yeah. go <laughs> and trying it was that um, essentially, you know, if we as the media are trying to make sure that society is representative from our from our perspective, i.e., on TV, radio, and on our digital content, yeah. then the people who are being offered to us as spokespeople, as experts, um, as the stories need to also be reflective of society and so by getting other organizations outside the media to think about this and to think about the talent that's in their own organizations and putting them forward then you know we're able to kind of have a more holistic approach to making sure that our content is reflective of society yeah no totally and I think to your point and going back to where we first started talking about just educating the population and say when you're when you were that seven-year-old self when I was a child with my brother's child My kids now grown up, when they watch the TV, they watch who they think they want to be. And now they're seeing people that we didn't get to see. So I think this is a really, really special time. And I think that thanks to to the 50-50 project really for doing this, because it's really spearheading something that's really taken so many industries by storm. So I love it, you know. And in fact, you guys have been so successful that um, you're now branching into other areas as well, aren't you? You're looking into, I think, disability and ethnicity, aren't you? Tell us a little bit about that. That's super exciting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, We're so uh, excited about this. So, um, you know, we've learned so much from improving women's representation. um, And there's so much that can translate from what we've learned over to improving representation for other groups. And so um, race and disability are the two that, that we're focusing on now. So we're taking those kind of core principles that we've learned from uh, from women's representation and, and translating it over so those three core principles are um, data to affect change so we're still monitoring we're still going to be um, looking to reach a certain target over a set period of time uh, measure what you control of course most important as I say um, and then <laughs> the key thing um, and this is one really for our for our content makers um, and it is that the best content must always get on air. So that means the best contributor. So we don't want people on just because they're a woman, just because they're Indian, just because they have a disability. We want them on because they are the expert in the area that they're talking about. Um, And so that's the real key driver um, so that we want to make sure that every voice is heard in an everyday way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Yeah. so that must be quite interesting to juggle for you actually doing that. So what have been some, I guess, some lessons learned along the way? Um, I think um, lessons learned loads. <laughs> I'm trying to think <laughs> of where to start. Um, I, mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing that, that we've been looking at is, um, you know, creating momentum and um, a true kind of spirit of collaboration. That's the thing that's really, really worked. Um, and it's been amazing. I think when we first started this project, um, one of the things that you uh, people might think about with journalists is that, you know, we have a contacts book and we don't share it. And, you know, it's, you know that, that was a real kind of thing, actually, when I first started in journalism. And by doing that, we stopped diversity. And one of the things that's been really interesting in this project is the amount that people share um, in terms of experts um, and contributors across platforms now. Um, and that's been great. And, and seeing, actually, that there is that um, within us as, as, as an industry. Um, so that collaboration has been um, brilliant. But it, it has been, um, how do you get people to change their mindset? Um, and right. that's been very interesting. So um, one of the great things about 5050 is that we started with people who are passionate about creating change. And then when others see that change is possible, that helps bring them over to to try and make the change themselves. And so having that mindset change is by, is again, is that kind of peer-to-peer dynamic. And that's been uh, really, really powerful. 
And so when we started the ethnicity and disability pilot, what was really interesting, we thought that we would have to start from scratch like we did with, with women going around doing a bit of a hustle, saying, yeah, you want to have a go? Um, whereas this time, um, we just put out an email and uh, saying, does anyone want to have a go at um, piloting 50-50 for ethnicity and disability? Uh, and we have um, over 55 um, teams across the BBC piloting it, wow. uh, which is amazing. Um, that shows that there's a mindset change happening within the BBC. That's, and that's really exciting to see. No, that, that sounds really great. And I think there'll also probably be some crossover as well, because from the pool that said, OK, we're going to sign up for the women part of the project. I'm guessing some of them anyway might have come from different ethnic backgrounds or had disabilities as well. So by default of that, there might be some crossover. So I think that's just so it's super brilliant about doing all this. Um, but I think I agree with you. It's all about changing mindsets, really. Um, and trying to have those conversations, sometimes difficult ones, to get people to just hear different points of view. And you can't do that unless you show people from different backgrounds, but not just show them, actually show their lives and let them deliver the message as well. So I think that's brilliant, um, the way you're doing that. Wonderful. So what's next on the horizon for you, um, professionally and personally as well? Well, personally, I'm thinking about (laughs) that one. Uh, Professionally, (laughs) that was an easier one to... We'll come back to personally. (laughs) Yeah. Professionally, I have one mission, um, and that is um, to create content that is representative of society. It's about, you know, helping to um, give that different perspective, as you say, kind of getting our content makers to think differently um, and embrace change um, and take and, and have the permission to try something that perhaps is outside of their comfort zone. Um, my my team, um, we call it um, happy fail. So, you know, try it, see what happens. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. You know, nothing's going to, it's not going to be the end of the world. So, um, so just that continued mission of improving that representation so that we have a media that is reflective of society so that our children, as you say, can... Mm-hmm be themselves and what they could be in the future and that that to me just it just makes me really excited every time I think about the mission and um, and and seeing how actually it's doable we can do this um, I suppose for me it's about downtime um because well since lockdown in March it's been hectic really um you know I've been back in the newsroom helping with critical core services um, to make sure that the news does get on air. Um, and um, I've been doing that on top of the day job as creative diversity lead. Um, so I'm pretty much looking forward to a break. Um, and actually, I'm um, quite lucky. Um, we're um, off to Snowdonia, which is a mountain in Wales. Um, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so a bit, of, a bit of walking, a bit of fresh air. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But frankly, I think, you know, what we all need, um, because it is in flux at the moment in terms of, um, you know, what's life like? Yeah. So, um, you know, in a post-COVID world, when we find this kind of new normal, um, as people call it, I'm just hoping to find a little bit more zen, I think. <laughs> I think that's yes, what I'm really really that. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. So final words, um, what advice would you give to any of your viewers or any sort of budding journalists who kind of want to follow in your footsteps, you know, want to go into journalism, media, or really want to just make a difference in society? So on the media front, um, I think the the biggest thing is is about showing your passion for, for journalism, or if you're interested in creative industry, showing your passion for the content that you're interested in creating. Um, so, you know, portfolios are a big, um, let's put it that way. So, you know, writing blogs, um, I used to volunteer at my local hospital radio station. So if you've got a local volunteering radio station, something like that, work experience, it's just building up that kind of um, evidence base that, you know, this is the thing that you really, really love and that you really want to do. I mean, these days as well, it's easier to edit videos together, you know, phones is such good quality in terms of video that you can just go and film your own video and edit it together and it just shows the skill set that you have um so so doing that is is probably number one and then number two is building contacts um this industry is all based around who you know um 
So, um, you know, making sure that you, you're kind of connecting with people um, and, and, and people are really willing to connect. I mean, I, I promise you, we're not scary people. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> LinkedIn is a great source for that. Um, other social media does exist. Um, <laughs> as we say, um, but it's a really great source of information. Um, and obviously, from a BBC perspective, there's the BBC Academy um, with loads of, of, of information on there about how you can get into the industry um, and BBC Careers website. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 those kind of ideas, really. And then um, in terms of making a difference in society, um, I think we can all do that. Um, everyone has the the ability to to make difference um for me it's um really about championing voices um it's about making sure underrepresented people get heard and we can all do that you know i don't know there's someone you might know who who's done something really brilliantly it might be something that seems small and incidental but shout about it you know yeah. that will yeah. give them the confidence to to put themselves forward for things and I think you know that's a real gift that we can all give absolutely oh thank you so much for sharing that Nina that your incredible journey and those really wise words so Nina Goswami creative diversity lead at the BBC thank you so much and thank you to our viewers for joining us today on this empowerment journey we want you all to embrace that inner goddess of go-getting we want you all to be bold be you be Uma